Jack Dorsey, welcome to Conversation With. Thank you. So you've been cleaning up Twitter of all these fake accounts and you've lost a good number of followers and so have many other, uh, you know, well-known persons. Do you think that these, these various sort of cleansings that you've been doing are just marginals? It's, it's not that many. These are actions that we've, we could have and should have taken some time ago. Um, it's taken us some time to really understand uh, the dynamics and what's going on and, uh, and make sure that we're in a place where we can do this and happy to state that now we are because we have a better understanding of the system um, and how these things work. Um, I think any time we take actions like this, we are improving the health of the overall conversation because you're not having to guess about what's real and what's not real. Um, what's meant to game a system in order to show that an account might be more popular than another account or to trend or whatnot. So we've been making a lot of progress in terms of uh, actions against folks who in bad faith are intending to game our systems. How much though uh, would you say uh, these, these fake accounts really are a problem in the sense that there's a difference between let's say discovering that uh, two or three percent of the followers of a particular person are not actually real people to saying 10 or 20 percent. That's, that's really a lot. Well first and foremost we look at behaviors on the network. Um, so uh, every week we challenge over eight million accounts as to whether they are humans or bots. Uh, Eight million mm -hmm. every week. Mm -hmm. So we've been fairly aggressive around this. Um, and it's in the spirit of making sure that we're giving people the right context so that they don't even have to think about is this real or is this um, controlled by someone that uh, is intending bad faith. Um, so again, this is a process. So we have to start somewhere. We have to get better and better and better. Um, and, uh, you know, we made some big uh, moves in the, in the short term. I wouldn't call them marginal by any means, um, but uh, they were the right thing to do based on everything that we were seeing and will continue to do so. Well, let me cut now to one of the uh, questions that uh, our viewers put forward. It was from Edwin Koo. He says, how does Twitter plan to deal with heavily followed accounts that consistently violate Twitter's terms of service but still aren't banned yet? Well, so uh, any Every single account is ruled and judged by our terms of service. So we take action on it, period. One of the, of course, controversial ones has been, for example, President Trump, mm -hmm. um, and whether or not some of the statements that he's made um, tantamount to some kind of form of uh, incitement, sort of hate or hate speech or violence. Um, but Twitter said that, well, governments and, and the military aren't included. Isn't that a bit of a sort of a, a loophole that you're putting in? Why doesn't it apply to governments and, and military? Well, it's not governments and military. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, world leaders um, and their particular accounts. And the reason why is, as a journalist, you know the concept of newsworthiness and public interest. And uh, we believe it's important for people to hear from their world leaders directly. And if we can be a vehicle for that, great. Um, they're going to say some things that people disagree with on our platform and some things that people disagree with on channels like yours. And um, we, we want to make sure that we are showing the public record of what was said, but more importantly, the discussion around it. Um, we have had a very rich history of people speaking truth to power. Um, and if we remove that, um, then that ability to have that conversation also potentially goes away as well. Um, so just like you all, we have a clause around news newsworthiness, public interest, which is judgment-based, and we focus that on world leaders uh, and making sure that we are hearing directly from them so that we can continue to enrich the conversation. But isn't that the difficulty? Because a news organization is clearly a news organization. But you're not a news organization as such, uh, unless you're redefining yourself. So you're, you're taking on some of the, uh, of the roles that news makers and uh, news organizations take on without actually being journalists. Well, but the difference is we have our most important constituency on the platform are journalists. And so our focus is on conversation. And if we are limiting our journalists' ability to have conversations around what's happening in the world, 
um, then we are not valuable to them and we're not valuable to the world. So the implicit bit that's in Edwin's question is, is that you are not merely maintaining these various accounts, like let's say President Trump or any other sort of world leader, purely because they have lots and lots of followers. Because that's really what it is, no, isn't it? No, no, we have suspended accounts that, don't, that have lots and lots of followers. For example? Um, and none, none are coming to the top of my head, but you can, you can see through our history. So you would take down an account even if it had lots of followers, millions of followers. If they violate followers. our rules, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I suppose it's this discomfort with, you know, when is it that you would do things that would actually also hurt you on the bottom line? We don't think about that. You're a listed company. Mm -hmm. If you weren't a listed company, that might seem more plausible. But as a listed company, can you afford to say that you don't think of the bottom line? Well, we think about the bottom line, but not in regards to enforcing our actions. That was what you, that, that's the question you asked, I believe? Yes. So we want to make sure that like, we have clear terms of service out there, and we enforce them. And sometimes the enforcement is a permanent suspension. That's the ultimate extreme. Sometimes it's warnings. Um, sometimes it's a, a lock until you take particular action on tweets that violated our terms of service. So we have a spectrum of enforcement that we can take. Um, our revenue and bottom line never carries into our enforcement procedures. So is Jack Dorsey a liberal? Does Twitter think that it should just be a platform in which these political jostlings take place? Or do you need us to step in and actually also um, make sure that the political debate taking place uh, is a balanced one? I think it would be very hard for us to um, balance uh, conversation. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't help people by giving them tools to find that balance themselves. Uh, and that's our intention. So I think the more we can work through our algorithms and through humans to give people better tools to find uh, balance or to recognize misinformation or to understand credibility uh, within each other or particular accounts, uh, that feels like a win. Whether it's a platform or something else, I don't know if the categories really serve us well. Um, if we try to take something extremely complex and we try to put it into one word, uh, it often um, has the opposite effect of uh, simplifying the dynamics too much so that no one can actually get anything of value out of it. So I think you know, the, the way we're thinking about it is, number one, like how do we measure whether a particular conversation around an event or a debate um, is quote unquote healthy? And um, health is something we all understand, right? So you have an indicator of health, which is your temperature. And sometimes that temperature might be too high, sometimes it might be too low. And when it's either too high or too low, it indicates that your system is out of balance in some way. And if we understand that, then we can understand the spectrum of solutions that might help you. So based on all of our experiences, these are the sets of solutions and, and this is the effects um, of those solutions um, based on these observations. And so our desire is to first understand um, what are the indicators of health in conversation? And then secondarily, how do we measure those? And then thirdly, as we deploy tools to help give people context, um, to try to bring a debate back into a healthy civic dialogue, for instance, to be more representative of an election. How do we, um, how do we measure we're actually helping or hurting? But that presumes that there is a recognized norm. 
For example, if a person feels that uh, you don't want to have a secular debate, religion should be an integral part of a discussion. Uh, that person may disagree with another person who says, no, religion should not be. It should be a secular debate. We should not be discussing religion at all in an election. Absolutely. Definition of health changes over time, and it changes in regards to how people are using it within the time. Um, so it is not meant to be something that is static. It is something to be fairly dynamic and representative of the conversation that's currently unfolding. And uh, again, it's a tool that you can choose to use or not. But we believe over time that a greater collective will choose to use it because it helps us progress much faster. It is not meant to say that this particular argument is invalid or not. Again, I don't think we're going to do anything valuable if we're making those judgments. If we can give people context, in terms of what's happening around these conversations, around what's happening around these debates, then they can make their own decisions. But that presumes that uh, they might make decisions that uh, would also be, could also be potentially harmful to other persons. Not everybody makes the decisions saying that they have generosity to the world. It does, but other people will call those out. So let's come to that because Twitter has been accused of being liberal. Do you think that a platform can be politically neutral and or that you are essentially liberal in the way that you edit things going on in Twitter? I would rather know someone's bias and have them talk about it than it be in the dark and have to assume what's happening. So is Jack Dorsey a liberal? I, I wouldn't necessarily call myself a liberal, uh, but I, I would say that um, uh, I do have uh, more of a left view of things. Um, on particular issues and more of a right view of things on other issues. So again, if you go back down to just one word to describe one person or any concept, you're really missing the full spectrum of the individual, of the company, or of the service. So I, I just think that's a somewhat lazy um, way of thinking and it's not representative of anyone on the planet, uh, much less companies. But I do think it's important that we state our biases, that we state our principles, that we are open about them. And then we apply a scientific rigor and scientific method and open up how we make decisions so that uh, we can earn people's trust. Um, I, I don't believe anyone can state that they come at the work without bias. Do you think that Twitter will exist for another 20 years? One of the questions that we got from one of our viewers, this was Yana Abdul Karim. How does Twitter handle reports on tweets that are not in the English language? And he's referring to, you know, how do you then, let's say, look at when there is hate speech, but it's not, it doesn't happen to be in English? Mm -hmm. Well, so we have, uh, we have different teams that are represented around the world and they pay attention to local laws. Um, and if there are hate speech laws, for instance, then uh, we may have to act on that particular content. So they have the context of wherever they're in and the cultures that they are enforcing these actions around. In Indonesia, for example, there have been complaints from uh, the uh, authority side where they say that you know, the social media doesn't step in enough, uh, perhaps sometimes even doesn't know enough about the local language to be able to weed out when, for example, in Indonesia's case, uh, you know, there is a propagation of uh, terrorist type vocabulary as well as, as ideas. Do you think that that's fair, that they I, I don't that know you haven't been doing enough? I don't know if it's fair in that particular case. Could we always use more training? Could we always use more local people and resources? Absolutely. Um, we, uh, we need to figure out how to scale all these things. We have you know, the resources that we have, and uh, we are trying to work as quickly as possible to fill any particular gaps. But at the same time, we need to prioritize that as well. Um, so uh, we, we would like to have single global answers, but we know that's not always going to be possible. Um, and uh, it does require real work to change that, especially at a local level. 
Why can't something like artificial intelligence take care of all of this, all this monitoring of, of all these millions of tweets? Well, so we're, as an industry, still figuring out the best ways to apply um, the aspects of arti artificial intelligence that are most relevant. Um, artificial intelligence is a massive category. Um, so specifically, we're, we're looking at machine learning and deep learning within those categories. And um, I think the most uh, interesting field within AI right now is how an algorithm actually explains its decision-making process. Right now, they are often seen as black boxes, and you don't really understand how it's making a decision, why it made a decision. So I think that's really critical um, to um, making sure that people trust the decisions and judgments being made um, before we get too far ahead of ourselves just trying to apply it to everything. Does this mean then that we will always still have human beings looking through tweets to decide whether or not they are healthy or unhealthy? Well, the way we operate is we have um, algorithms kind of bubble up interestingness. So this is really interesting. I can't make a particular judgment about this. And, and then humans can add that judgment with the eye towards thinking a lot more cohesively, looking at uh, what the context is and applying, you know, um, some of the cultural context that we need to within particular areas of the world. Uh, so yes, I, I always think that pairing is important. I think technology at its best is helps us get these amazing superpowers that allow us to work faster and do things that we were never able to do in the past, it makes everything a lot more possible. Is there a point that you think that you'd have done what you wanted for Twitter and that you've grown it to the size you want and you wouldn't need to be CEO of Twitter anymore? Uh, I don't think about it that way. I mean, I'm, I'm here to serve the company and the people that we serve. And uh, I think Twitter has relevance to every single person in the world and has value to every single person in the world. We haven't done the best job at showing why it is valuable to everyone in the world. And that's what we're working on. And as long as I am um, contributing in a way that uh, um, is furthering us along that goal, um, then I'm useful. When I'm not useful, then um, I, you know, the company should do something else. Okay, and then I'll get to the last, the very last question that we had sent in. It's from Tagar Hidayatula, and the question is, what was your motivation in making this platform? Do you think that Twitter will exist for another 20 years? I think it'll exist for a thousand years. It'll take on a different format, of course, because technology changes. But I think it reached something really fundamental, which is conversation. When we started it, it was just to have a conversation in public with each other and uh, share what was happening with us. And um, the people that started using it more and more showed that it was relevant to them and that they wanted to have conversation out in the open in the world and I think it I think it hit a nerve that um, is really foundational and I think that is what persisted. Jack Dorsey, thank you very much for being on conversation with. Thanks for having me.